Paul Saladino is a carnivore doctor. He claims to be the leading authority on the carnivore diet. That doesn't make much sense, considering he received his MD in psychiatry merely two years ago, has barely any clinical experience, let alone in nutrition, hasn't even been following the carnivore diet for two years, and just prior to that, had a face full of spinach telling you how good plant foods are. Since Paul has graced us with his presence, his ideas and information have been plagiarized from several sources, mostly my own YouTube channel. Paul has copied his way all the way to the Joe Rogan experience, and to no surprise, he plagiarized over 50 of my ideas to structure the entire conversation of the podcast. For anyone unfamiliar, the definition of plagiarism is passing someone else's ideas off as your own without crediting them. Since many of Paul's buddies are telling me this isn't plagiarism and that I should be grateful for him spreading my knowledge, I thought things over. And one of my buddies made Paul a website as a thank you present. Check out paulsaladino.com for all of Paul's amazing ideas. Since there are so many instances of plagiarism on this podcast, I'm going to play the clip from the Joe Rogan podcast, play my clip from several months to years ago on my YouTube channel, then I'll briefly explain it. And keep in mind, this is what I had the willingness to find. I would safely bet there's over 100 instances in this entire podcast of direct plagiarism. And before we start, I do want to say, whoever wrote the script for this podcast did an excellent job of condensing the past three years of my YouTube channel into a few hours. So like when I tell people I eat mostly meat, they look at me like like you're doing something really stupid. Like Rob Lowe started laughing at me. I said I have like an animal-based diet. You know, some people are plant-based. I'm animal-based. I love that word. Yeah, animal-based. Yeah. Just steal what they're saying. <laughs> the majority of the nutrients our bodies require come from animal-based foods, whereas plant foods serve a lesser purpose of energy, whole foods, meat-based diet, is a stab at the whole foods plant-based uh, nonsense as animal foods need to comprise the majority of an optimal human diet. One, just in the first minute, they already stole one of my creative concepts. The reason I put whole foods meat-based diet in the title of my book is because I thought if someone stole that creative concept, that take on whole foods plant-based diet, it would be such blatant and obvious plagiarism, they wouldn't be able to get away with it. How can they steal something I put in the title of my book over a year ago? It's ridiculous. And I think that if people spend time in the wilderness, regardless of the latitude, they'll start to appreciate this. Yeah. And I've mostly spent time in, in latitudes that are further from the equator than not. But even at the equator, if you go walking around the woods and or the, the forest or the jungle there and you try to eat leaves or stems or bark, you're, you're going to die. You're going to die <laughs> really freaking fast. Well, how about people who collect mushrooms? Like they make mistakes. The thing about foraging for fruits or vegetables or tubers, you would actually starve to death in the wild, essentially. Uh, they can be used... And these plant foods can be used to supplement a diet, but if you were stuck in a survival setting, you would not survive on plant foods regardless of how much access to them you had. Humans need to survive in nature, and if you're eating berries in the forest all day, it doesn't matter if you have unlimited access to berries, you will starve to death eating fruit. Two, the idea that you'd starve in the wilderness with only plant foods is something I've been saying for years on my channel. As I was learning about this and thinking about carnivore diets and animal-based diets, I had to learn a lot of stuff myself. I'm a, I was trained as a physician. I wasn't trained as an anthropologist, and I took ecology in college, but... <sighs> you learned it yourself, Paul? You mean from Frank Tofano's YouTube channel? Here's, here's a question, though. Is it good to eat some of them? Because there's this thing, and, and I know you've discussed this as well, the hormetic response, right? Like where your body responds to these uh, effects that these plants are producing, and it actually the the response by your body is good. The same way the response from a sauna is good. So as I was writing my book, I came up with these terms: environmental hormesis and molecular hormesis. I'll grab your book; it's right here. Molecular hormesis is broadly termed xenohormesis by some people. Xeno is this Latin term that means alien or foreign. So. 
when you think about these, a lot of, in common parlance, people lump together exercise, ketosis, sunlight, sauna with plant compounds. But I think that's, that's not accurate. I don't think we should be doing that. I think we have environmental hormesis and molecular hormesis, and they're different things. Or when you're in the sun or when you exercise, you do generate reactive oxygen species, superoxide radicals, and they activate a system in your body called the NRF2 system. I can pull up a picture of it in a second. And that turns on genes that are involved in the antioxidant response to manage these free radicals. When people talk about hormesis and the, and the benefits of added stressors, I really think that in the context of human diet, it's really different. It's like if you had a car and you fill the tank up with gasoline, is putting a little bit of diesel going to stress the engine? And I mean, this is probably a terrible analogy, but you know, would you put a little bit of diesel in your car engine just to stress it and make it run better? That, that's kind of what I'm thinking about here. Right. Like, why would you purposely put something that will damage, you know, to build up resistance to it in the future to have an immune response? I think the hormetic effect can be obtained in other ways, such as exercise, such as caloric deprivation. Uh, I think there are ways to achieve hormesis outside of consuming inflammatory foods in a way. Mm. You aren't producing antioxidants through exercise. Tanning, you know, being in the sun, technically damages your skin. It causes oxidative stress. Three, molecular versus environmental hormesis is something I've explained in the past Paul is trying to coin it as his own new thing. I think that there certainly are studies with molecules like sulforaphane, which is this isothiocyanate compound from broccoli, that show that it also triggers NRF2. It triggers this antioxidant response system. But what we aren't told about much is the other side effects of sulforaphane, the so-called package insert that sulforaphane has. And when you look at that, there's a large amount of evidence that this whole class of molecules isothiocyanates actually have many negative effects in the body. And when you think about it from a plant's perspective, sulforaphane is pretty clearly a toxin. It's a booby trap. Isothiocyanates stimulate detoxification enzymes, inflammatory response. They interfere with DNA segregation resulting in cell death. They inhibit iodine uptake, which can kind of be countered with a higher iodine intake, but they also inhibit thyroid hormone and that can't be countered by anything if this is consumed in large amounts. Four, Paul takes some anti-nutrient information from one of my videos about isothiocyanates. And it's crazy how this guy's memory works because he'll literally say the specific bullet points from my video in the same order I said them as well. But what about the vitamins that you're getting from plants? I mean, right. there, are, there, are, there are essential nutrients and phytonutrients that you get from plants. What about those? So this is really interesting when you look into it. There are really, this is going to sound extreme when I say it, but I'll back it up. There are no nutrients in plants that you cannot get from animal foods in essentially equivalent or more bioequivalent forms. Of that 65 to 70% animal foods was where we got all of our nutrients and vitamins that we needed for optimal health. Our omega-3 fatty acids, our vitamins A, our fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. All those are from animal foods and they are contained in animal foods in their most bioavailable forms. Plant foods are missing key vitamins and not only that, the forms of vitamins in animal foods have much higher bioavailability and in some cases, the forms of vitamins in plant foods aren't available to the human digestive system at all. You can't say the same thing about plants. There are no nutrients that occur in plants that you can't get from animal food. Animal foods not only have vitamins that plant foods are missing, every single vitamin that is in animal foods is in a more available form than the plant version. And in some cases, the plant version is not available at all. Five, this quote is actually something he's plagiarized in the past several times, an original quote that I've been saying for three, four years now. And doses as low as 10 milligrams of vitamin C per day could prevent scurvy. The body only needs 10 milligrams of vitamin C a day to prevent scurvy. Six, what a surprise. We both came to the same conclusion that 10 milligrams of vitamin C per day prevents scurvy. Although something like this isn't as direct as the other examples of plagiarism, it's important to note as there are too many of these coincidences 
of him coming to the same conclusion as myself. This expression nose to tail, a lot of people don't know what we're talking about. What, you, what you're talking about is organ meats. Yeah. Yeah, is eating organ meats because most people when they think of eating animal products, they think of just eating tissue, muscle tissue. Seven, this is an example of plagiarizing someone else. Paul has been using this nose to tail term for over a year without ever saying where it came from. A famous British chef, Fergus Henderson's book. Like, it's not your idea. So he would say that um, while meat of any kind is in great demand, it is interesting to note the following are the favorite cuts. The brisket of the beef with the fat and the cartilages. So these indigenous cultures in the, um, in the Arctic, would, uh, they would favor things with fat and connective tissue. The skin and subcutaneous fat of the warthog, pig skin, hog's head and brains. And number four is the liver of any animal. Eight, that book excerpt is actually something I tweeted Joe Rogan two years ago. Now they're showing the exact same one on the podcast. I, I kind of have this thing that I like to do with people where I have them eat raw liver. And mm -hmm. it's really cool to see how it turns their brain on. The baseline nutrition depends, you know, will determine how much of a buzz they get. In my experience, this high feeling is not just specific to rotten animal foods. I get this feeling when I go out in the sun, when I eat fresh liver, when I eat fish eggs. There's something about obtaining nutrients in our natural environment that makes us feel good. Nine, Paul is acting like he discovered eating raw liver and high meat. Sparage, as well as myself, have been doing it on YouTube for several years. You lose a little bit of nutrients when you cook it. Not much, but you lose a little bit. So I've always been fascinated by how many of, this is such a nutrient rich organ, how much of it can I actually preserve mm. in terms of nutrients? And do I feel differently when I eat it raw? So overall, yes, we do lose some nutrients when we heat meat, especially well done for a long period of time. But the temperature that most people cook meat to is not too significant of an issue. 10. Oh, look, Paul also thinks the nutrient loss from cooking isn't that big of a deal. Great idea, buddy. I think the same. This fucking douchebag. Fucking asshole. Yeah, real fucking genius. You might as well have me in a fucking earpiece in your ear. You can alter food in some ways to make it more palatable and to kind of short circuit the satiety mechanisms. These ducks are the basic principle is that foods occur in nature in certain states and humans have the ability to alter food using various ways. 11, not only is Paul taking my ideas, he's trying to sound like me, he's using similar words. Food palatability and satiety are things I've been mentioning for years, but he just takes those terms that I haven't heard anyone else besides myself use. So few humans in 2020 have gone for more than 18 hours without eating food. Yeah. Very few of us, in, in how many decades we've lived or have utilized the fat burning systems in our body. Yeah, to me, it's absolutely absurd when I think of like my mother or my sister or my father and they literally have never gone, you know, three to four hours without eating something in their entire lives. Think about how much stress the average person puts on their body, on themselves every single day by consuming completely shit food every few hours. It's really amazing uh, the difference between someone that follows a standard American diet versus someone that is mindful of their food choices. It's a constant state of inflammation versus a, a constant state of, you know, how we're supposed to be. 12. Very few people have gone their whole lives without eating food. I thought that sounded familiar. But if we're doing the standard American thing, which is to eat constantly and snack throughout the day and then can't wait to have dinner and then can't wait to have breakfast and can't wait to have lunch and... Your, your body never really gets a break. It's always digesting. When people follow a standard American diet or any modern diet, you're literally consuming inflammatory foods every few hours the entire day. You know, you're waking up, you're drinking coffee, that's inflammatory. You're having an egg McMuffin for breakfast, a croissant, that's inflammatory. You're having some crappy refined bread, sandwich, salad for lunch, you know, and then for dinner you're having pizza, snacks throughout the day, potato chips, whatever it may be. The constant person is always in a state of inflammation. 13, hey Joe, that sounds familiar too. We wouldn't have been successful in hunts every day. We would have had some hunts that were successful and some gathering sessions which were, which were successful and others which weren't. And when they're not successful, you're, you're fasting. You can imagine 
the only way you can really break a fast in nature is to hunt an animal. And if you really were starving, you would have probably eaten some of that animal raw. It was more about having a steady supply. So, you know, if we killed an animal, maybe we would eat really well for two, three or four days and then go periods of time without food. Why not live according to the way our ancestors had access to food? In a sense that we might not have always had access to food for days or maybe weeks at a time. 14. I compare fasting to caloric deprivation from poor hunting. Tissues in the body that require glucose. And this is why if you eat only meat, you will get knocked out of ketosis if you have too much protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which may not necessarily be a bad thing. Right. It's just, it's human physiology. People worry about too much protein, knocking them out of ketosis on a carnivore diet. But unless you have some underlying medical condition where your body has to maintain a certain blood sugar level, you shouldn't worry about natural eating patterns causing you to leave ketosis. It's not this end all be all magical. 15, leaving ketosis isn't the end of the world. Hey, great idea, Paul. Honey has a lot of really unique properties too, doesn't it? It does, yeah. There's, there's a certain honey, I, I wanna say it's from New Zealand. My wife was just talking to me about it the other day. Manuka? Yes, that actually helps people heal better. I think a lot of honeys do that, actually. Now, Manuka has a very good publicist. I haven't seen any. Is that what it is? I think it might. Uh, I think it's a, super expensive. Yeah, I think a lot of honeys can help with that. But if you look at the literature on honey, there's studies. So, so this is a very special type of honey. And because there are some losers out there that plagiarize people and ruin things for everyone else, I can't tell you guys what it is. 16. Paul jumped on the honey bandwagon after he saw me eat it, but I couldn't find the exact video where I debunked Manuka honey. I think it was in one of my day of eatings. The point is, this guy copies every single thing I say, every single thing I do, the words I say, my mannerisms, it's really creepy. So fructose bypasses phosphofructokinase and can essentially move down the shared glycolytic pathway into the formation of the glycerol backbone and triglycerides, which are essentially fats, without any, uh, without any breaks. Again, in orange, the impairment of glucose by fatty acid oxidation, it increases along the pathway. 17. I think this next idea was actually stolen from Ray Pete, but he could have also seen it in my Randall Cycle video. I, there's some really interesting evidence that polyunsaturated fatty acids probably hijack these satiety mechanisms as well, and that linoleic acid specifically and other omega-6s can have negative consequences at the level of the brain, and you don't get that satiety response to turn off. High omega-6 in the diet from eating too much conventional beef, eggs, pork, and chicken can increase appetite due to an imbalance in the endocannabinoid system, so you end up overeating that crappy feedlot meat, and these issues just keep compounding themselves. And there are downsides to consuming too much arachidonic acid, one of them being an imbalanced appetite due to disruption of the endocannabinoid system. 18. Omega-6 disrupts satiety? Yeah, I might have said that a dozen times on my channel. Their eyes kind of, the gears start turning. They're like, maybe I could do that. Mm. And it starts to look like, I would say, a reimagined version of a Paleolithic diet, because that's what we're essentially asking. And some of you guys might be thinking, Frank, are you rebranding the Paleo diet? Is this about the WAPF stuff? 19. New take on the Paleo diet? Wow, Paul! We sure have great ideas together. It's frankly toxic. Apples do not want you to eat the seed. But they don't mind if you swallow them and shit them out. Shit them out in a nice pile of fertilizer. Right. Which and is how they wind up growing. How they grow. Seeds tend to be the highest in anti-nutrients because that seed wants to survive the digestive tract, be implanted in the fecal matter, and grow into a tree. That's what nature intended it to do. 20. Seeds are meant to pass through digestion. This is actually the second time he's plagiarized this quote from that coffee video. But the story that I've heard from him and, and other vegans is is valid, but it is often, I was eating a diet of junk food. Right, I that's was, it. I was drinking a lot, Yep. And, and I did this intentional choice, which is freaking amazing. I would give anybody a high five. I think anyone deserves congratulations for making any intentional choice in their diet. I just wanna provide information to help them make the best choice. Right. And so, I think that they, they've made intentional choices. They've cut out processed seed oils. They've mm -hmm. cut out you know, processed food and they feel better. And my question is, have you done the other thing? Right, exactly. Have you eaten meat and organs? 
And since most people are following a standard American diet before they go vegan, they do feel better. You're going to feel better when you remove that poison from your diet that you're eating every few hours every single day. So you went from a very negative diet to a neutral diet. 21. Vegan diet is healthier than a standard American diet. That vegans remove processed foods and feel better, but would improve eating animal foods. Another thing I've said so many times on my channel, you know, I tend to talk about certain topics frequently, whether it's vegans, whether it's living naturally, whether it's this or that, and I've developed creative concepts in every single one of these, and he's he just ripping them off. Grass. Have you eaten raw liver, Ritual? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. that'll maybe, get you maybe don't give him that. <laughs> that'll get you high. I don't think he got me high. <laughs> uh, it was okay. It was edible. High meat is essentially rotten meat. And the reason it was coined high meat is because you literally get a high feeling. 22. Second time of him mentioning liver getting you high. Exactly. There's such a high proportion of them that eat it when they get what drunk. What is the number? Let's, I think see, it's 30 to 40 percent, Joe. See, let's find it. Well, I love this statistic. It's a weird statistic, right? Because who's answering these? I always wonder, like, who's who are you asking? Like, there's so many people that never get asked. Yeah. Like, how many people that are vegetarians that get drunk and eat meat and you never ask them? And how many people stay strong and they, do, they stick to their diet when they get drunk? Vegans do sure go out of their way to replicate animal foods as closely as possible with plant foods. 23. Just like he steals my information, takes my phrases, of course he's going to steal my anti-vegan perspective. And the... Uh, consumption of meat has gone up, so we'll, we'll consider meat as a probable driver. But look at that red line in the middle. <laughs> you see what that line is? Yeah. That's vegetable oil, man. There's two problems with our modern diets. Not enough animal foods and too much crap. Vegetable oils, refined foods, sugar. If you dig into that meat as a driver, this is the um, 10.18.34, Jamie. Look at the total meat consumption by type. Um, that one. So what are we eating more of? It's not red meat, the type that, that's getting vilified. We're eating more chicken. <laughs> so the idea that meat is continuing to have a negative effect on our health doesn't make sense if we actually look at per capita red meat consumption statistics. It has actually gone down drastically over the past few years, heavily in favor of poultry. 24. Paul showed some charts comparing chronic disease rates to vegetable seed oil consumption. I think I showed that on a live stream or a debate, but I couldn't bother to find it, but I did find him using the same narrative on reduced beef consumption in favor of poultry. Damaged cells and damaged proteins within cells and damaged mitochondria. So within the cell, there are these, quote, powerhouse factories, which are probably ancient bacteria, you know, billions of years ago that combined with a single-celled organism and we became eukaryotic with a membrane-bound nucleus and a membrane-bound organelle called a mitochondria. Your body is a partnership between you and these bacteria called mitochondria that partnered up, you know, a billion years ago or whatever to allow complex life to evolve. 25. This guy must have a photographic memory because he remembers odd nuanced phrases from my older videos. This time he's stealing from Tucker Goodrich. These polyunsaturated fats they, they act differently in our body, and we don't fully have this figured out. But at the level of our mitochondria, it does look like these polyunsaturated fats, this linoleic acid-rich vegetable oil, is signaling things differently. And it, I'm, I think it's really, there's a lot of compelling evidence to suggest that linoleic acid is driving adipocyte hypertrophy, meaning fat cells are getting bigger. If you take the cardiolipin, if you take the cardiolipin and you replace, say, linoleic acid with oleic acid, all of a sudden they become almost impervious to oxidative damage, mm -hmm. right? 26. Paul, apparently we do have it figured out because I spoke about it over a year ago. You are stealing Tucker Goodrich's hypothesis and passing it off as your own. And really stop consuming animals fed corn and soy, especially pigs and, tur and, and monogastric animals like chickens. That's because when you feed the animal corn or soy, you guys might be thinking it's okay just to avoid vegetable oils, avoid seed oils. But when they're feeding these seed oils to animals, the fatty composition of the animal, of the pig, of the fish, of the chicken, becomes composed of linoleic acid. 
Ruminants are unique because they have a rumen. Ruminants can take polyunsaturated fats and put and make them into saturated fats. Humans can't do this. Monogastric animals, humans, chickens, uh, pigs, they can't do that. Cattle metabolize corn and soy differently than pigs and chickens, so their meat isn't as high in omega-6, but the animals are just as sick. Anything, any polyunsaturated fat you give a pig is ending up in its fat. Any polyunsaturated fat that you or I eat is ending up in our fat tissue. We don't, we need a small amount, but there's an evolutionary amount that I think has always been seen. If we look at cultures of indigenous people, they all have two to 3% of their calories as linoleic acid. So by consuming a high fat pork product or chicken product that wasn't raised properly, it's akin to consuming a vegetable oil in a way. Well, it is, you are consuming the vegetable yeah. oil. It's just packaged in a chicken instead of in a bottle. 27, G. I wonder who first started talking about all the crap corn and soy we're feeding the animals in the carnivore community. Hmm, could it have been Frank Tofano? When you eat fat in your diet, it, it is generally in triglyceride form, which is packaged into molecules called chylomicrons, which move from the intestines to the liver. In the liver, cholesterol, which is actually a steroid backbone molecule, is packaged with triglycerides into a VLDL, a very de low density lipoprotein particle. It's like a bus. It moves triglycerides and cholesterol around the body because they're nutrients, because they're essential for human life. The tissue of these animals contains everything our body needs. It gives us the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K2, all of the fatty acids our bodies need. And then we digest the triglycerides turn them into chylomicrons, and the chylomicrons transport these vitamins around our bodies. So why are we so afraid of our blood work? 28, he copied my explanation of nutrient transport in triglycerides. And again, this wouldn't necessarily be plagiarism, but once it's become blatantly obvious that any word that comes out of this guy's mouth has been learned from my YouTube channel, you just have to search and find it. If he says something that's intelligent or creative or appears new and exciting, it came from my YouTube channel. He does not do anything on his own. He's out surfing or doing some BS. Who knows what he's doing? But everything this guy says will be found on my YouTube channel. Guaranteed. Something that can be found on his own research, but he didn't do it. He didn't do his own research because he didn't have to. He's got it all laid out on a platform. Okay, this is the lipid hypothesis. I disagree with this. I think it's an incomplete hypothesis. The origin of the lipid hypothesis, the idea that cholesterol is bad for us, was hypothesized by Ansel Keys. And let's be clear. People think this lipid hypothesis is a fact, but a hypothesis is never proven. 29. Hey, Paul, we both disagree with the lipid hypothesis. Why do we only get atherosclerosis in arteries? There's the same amount of LDL throughout our body. Veins and arteries are a contiguous system. And so why are we developing plaque in arteries but not veins? And that's, we, we never see plaque in veins unless they are transplanted into the arterial system. So there's clearly more things going on. And in the case of arteries versus veins, the prevailing hypothesis is that it's endothelial damage. So the inside of a, the inside of a blood vessel is the endothelium. And something has to damage the endothelium for this to happen, it seems. And higher pressure systems, the arteries, seem to damage the endothelium and this network of glycoproteins on the surface of the endothelium called the glycocalyx. And that doesn't happen in veins. They're lower pressure. At least this is one. One really interesting thing is that heart disease is likely not possible unless you have high blood pressure because that blood flowing rapidly causes small tears in the arterial wall. Those tears can accumulate substances such as oxidized cholesterol from a high omega-6 diet. That forms an enlargement or a burst, you know, resulting in a full-on cardiac event. 30. Paul comes to the conclusion that high blood pressure needs to be present for heart disease, as I did over a year ago. LDL is not the arsonist, it's the firefighter who shows up to quell the blaze. And that, yeah, that's kind of a complicated analogy, but mm. you get the idea, like, a policeman shows up at the scene of a crime, does that mean he committed the crime? Because there is evidence that LDL ends up in atherosclerotic plaque. People blaming saturated fat and cholesterol for heart disease is like blaming firefighters for trying to put out a fire, and not only are they blaming the firefighters for the fire, they're pouring gasoline on the firefighters and then turning off their water supply. 
it's a little bit hypocritical once you actually understand how cholesterol is used in the body. 31. This is an analogy many people have made, but he probably saw it on my channel. Why look at other sources when Frank Tefano has everything you need pertaining to the carnivore diet? In the setting of metabolic dysfunction, the LDL, and this is just my hypothesis, right? I don't think anyone knows this. The LDL perhaps gets retained. So LDL is a lipoprotein. It, it, I think it moves in and out of the endothelium into the subendothelial space freely. And there's something about, there's potentially something about the LDL moving into that subendothelial space getting retained in that subendothelial space. So in the, if you were to take a blood vessel and cut it, you know, lengthwise and look down at like a tube, there's multiple layers. Look, I got more foam here. <laughs> so distracting for Joe. Sorry. <laughs> you know, there's multiple layers, right? The innermost layer, if the blood's in here, the innermost layer is the endothelium. And below that is the intima and then the, the submucosal layer and the adventitia. And just below the endothelium are immune cells called macrophages. And what appears to happen with atherosclerosis is that the, the, the LDL particles get retained in there for some reason. And the macrophages kind of pick them up. They eat them. They endocytose them. They phagocytose them. And so they kind of eat these LDL particles potentially as, you know, they're trying to take care of something that could be problematic. And then they become foam cells. They get full of more and more lipid. And that's the beginning of a fatty streak. And again, this is very high level basic stuff. It's not, um, it's a little more complex, but there's something going on, I think, at the level of that sub entima, that endothelial, the sub endothelial space, that these macrophages are not responding properly to LDL or the LDL looks damaged. Normally, endocytosis only brings a certain amount of LDL through the endothelium, but with dysfunction, it can be increased greatly. Same with transcytosis, and transcytosis is when the LDL cholesterol is taken into the intima, and various things from TNF-alpha can raise transcytosis up to 4.5 times, uh, oxidized LDLs, leaky gut, and then what happens is when all this excess cholesterol eventually leaks through the arterial wall for, from glycocalyx dysfunction, from endothelial cell dysfunction, from unregulated transcytosis because of inflammation. Now we have way too much LDL cholesterol in the arterial wall. So these proteoglycans bind to it, and what pretty much happens is the HDL cholesterol cannot keep up. So we can see how all these things can dysfunction and we can get too much LDL in the arterial wall. Now, what actually happens when there's too much LDL in the arterial wall? These SAMs, which are vascular cell adhesion molecules, mark the injured area, make a 911 call. This releases interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which raises C-reactive protein. And this is one thing that increases the transcytosis, which makes things worse. Monocytes, which are the police officers, the white blood cells, turn into macrophages. They ingest the excess LDL, form it into a foam cell, and this is what causes fatty streaks in the arteries. Now, this is fine as long as HDL comes along and esterifies the cholesterol, allows the cholesterol to be used by various cells and tissues. 32, and man, this one irritates me. I spent so many hours and hours and hours researching this one. But Paul is claiming this is his idea. The cause of heart disease is his hypothesis. Paul, doesn't think anyone knows this yet. Paul, I explained this two years ago, and I know you saw that video on my channel because you're saying the exact same thing. I am disgusted about how enthusiastic he is in presenting his new information. And so now you start to get into ideas of oxidized LDL versus native LDL. And what causes LDL to oxidize? Well, there's good evidence that excess linoleic acid in the diet might be doing it. Mm. Excess oxidative stress might be doing it. Or at the level of the macrophage, when you have metabolic dysfunction, it's broadly disordered insulin signaling. Is there a correlation between arterial, arterial plaque uh, increase and uh, increase in vegetable oils? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's a correlation. Yeah, we could draw the same graphs, yeah. If your LDL particle contains linoleic acid, your body converts it into HODE. 9-HODE and 13-HODE are metabolites that form under oxidative stress. Once linoleic acid becomes oxidized in LDL, aldehydes and ketones covalently bind ApoB creating LDL that is no longer recognized by the LDL receptors in the liver, but is now recognized by scavenger receptors on macrophages, leading to the classic foam cell formation and atherosclerosis, aka 
heart disease. Um, there are studies that show that the more linoleic acid you eat, the more enriched in linoleic acid your LDL particles become. And then mm. the more oxidized your LDL particles mm. become. And if you decrease LD, if you decrease linoleic acid, there's a decrease in the oxidation of the LDL particle. You are what you eat. If you consume vegetable seed oils in high amounts, all of the fats, the lipids in your body, including cholesterol, will turn into linoleic acid. Human adipose tissue studies have demonstrated that in the long run, its fatty acid composition approach that of the diet. The body starts recognizing that extra linoleic acid as an invader. Body starts attacking it, trying to remove it, resulting in incredible amounts of oxidative stress in the arteries, organs, essentially all tissues in the body. Many of the cells in your body are made up of fat and you don't want this to be inflammatory, toxic linoleic acid. So there's a lot of kind of pieces that look like the dots are connecting. So to connect the dots, to connect the dots, to connect the dots between all these chronic diseases and figuring out what the common denominators were, right? So it turns out that a natural human diet is pretty low in linoleic acid. 33, ooh, special number. Man, is he really running with the hard work of Tucker Goodrich, Ivor Cummins, as well as myself. The whole reason I think about this stuff, Joe, is because I want people that I care about to be around, and then I want to be able to share that with other people so that they can experience their life better. Really? You think about this stuff, Paul? You want to make people's lives better? Is that why you butcher my research and then charge $1,000 for a half-assed consultation to get people's LDL cholesterol up to 900 Moron. When you eat meat or fat, your bile contracts, there's hormones, cholecystokinin, you release bile. Bile is a combination of cholesterol, bile salts, bilirubin, and bile salts um, are supposed to be reabsorbed in your small intestine. So, you know, you have this stomach, a duodenum, a jejunum, an ileum, which is your small intestine. Then you have the ileocecal valve and the large intestine. The large intestine is like the, the colon, right? And the colon goes up and over and down. And so the, if, if, Bile acids end up in the colon, they are cathartic, meaning they will cause diarrhea. Intestinal bile acid transporters recycle bile from the small intestine to be reused. And if that's not functioning, it's another reason to have a lack of bile. If you don't have a gallbladder, the weaker bile will just trickle down into the small intestine and depending on your liver's ability to produce bile, you, know, you can have too much or too little and the former will usually cause diarrhea the latter causing constipation. 34. Hey Paul, I'm glad you watched my gallbladder video. It's comically ridiculous how this guy cannot add anything to the conversation. Where, literally, I don't get it. Just switch the words around a little bit and add something and it won't sound like you ripped it from my channel. He can't even do that. The fiber is such an interesting thing. So it's, it's none of it's true. If you actually look at the medical literature, there's no evidence that fiber improves constipation. Fiber is like the carbohydrate argument. You don't need fiber, you don't need carbohydrates. Eskimos did not get fiber. Babies do not get fiber when they drink breast milk. Fasting, people that fast still get bowel movements regardless of their fiber intake. Uh, it's just one of those things where the arguments for fiber. 35, recently I've changed my opinions on fiber, but Paul is still stuck with my old conclusion. I wonder if he'll shift gears in the near future as well. When I was a vegan, I lost 25 pounds of muscle mass and all kinds of other issues. 25 pounds from where you are now? Yeah. Wow, you yeah. must have been very, very I was thin. Very skinny. So I'm 170 to 175 now, and I was around 140, so even maybe 30 pounds. Wow. 30 pounds of muscle mass. How did you feel? Not great. And you did it for health because you thought it was a good thing to do? Yeah. So it was the beginning of my medical career. It was probably 15 years ago. 36. That's a lie. Paul says he was vegan 15 years ago, but we know from his deleted Instagram posts, it was more like two years ago. What he's doing now is probably better than the standard American diet. Yes. If you are very careful about supplementation and you think about creatine and carnitine and choline and vitamin K2 and B12 and bioavailable proteins, I mean... So in some cases, a vegan diet can actually be less inflammatory than a standard American diet. Protein, although vegans say, oh, you can get your protein from beans and lentils, the availability is very clear. Humans do not utilize it well. I'd like to think 
Uh, this is the most informative video out there on how to actually be healthy on a vegan diet. 37. A vegan diet is better than a standard American diet. Supplements? Sounds familiar. Talk about the least amount of suffering. You raise one animal in an ecosystem that is a cycle. That's the way it's been going for thousands, millions of years. The most vegan diet there is would be consuming one grass-fed animal per year, one or two cows per year. Because what justifies killing trillions of bugs, rodents, all of these things, ruining the biodiversity of the soil, destroying the environment, because what? It doesn't have eyes and a face. 38. One animal is the least amount of suffering. Great idea, Paul. Wish I would have thought of that myself. We're starting to think about the way our ancestors ate in an ancestrally consistent diet, but we also need to think about how the heck did they live? And there are certainly a lot of modern considerations that we have to keep in mind when trying to replicate the lives of an ideal human being in our indigenous, our hunter-gatherer ancestors. 41. Thinking about how our ancestors live, lifestyle, stealing another main focus of my channel. I thought your focus was the carnivore diet, Paul, not ancestral diets or living. You're going to start stealing everything else I do. About this so many times, but social media is such a double-edged sword. And it is such a double-edged sword. Double-edged sword. Double-edged sword. 40. Something about this guy using the phrases I've been saying for years really hurts me. Sometimes I think about the irony of 2020 or even the last century that we have, we've put ourselves in digital worlds to work on computers indoors to make fake numbers in a bank account or green pieces of paper that allow us to go hike. Well, Paul, apparently you do care a lot about that green paper because you stole information from other people to sell overpriced garbage supplements because you weren't intelligent or creative enough to do it yourself. I went to residency. I didn't expect this to happen. I got interested in stuff. I started talking about my ideas. And then suddenly you put ideas out there and there are people slinging shit at you all the Yelling, time. angry. Angry and charlatan. Calling you a fraud. clown or an idiot. It's like You started talking about your ideas. <laughs> it's funny that he's actually talking about me calling him out for his plagiarism. Paul, you are a clown because they're not your ideas. And I've had to, you know, when yeah. I first started the carnivore diet, I thought, okay, all carbohydrates are bad. Even in the last year and a half, I've kind of said, you know what, maybe there's some nuance here. And it's so strange because there's definitely a uh, religiosity in the carnivore community that I don't identify with. And there, there were people just, you know, hating. Well, and, there's a lot of people in the carnivore diet that are basically meat eating vegan. There has been fairly strong anti-carbohydrate dogma in the keto and carnivore communities lately. And they have fairly good reason. If you consume carbohydrates in large amounts on a diet with low quality foods, you'll get sick in more ways than one. 41. Just like myself, Paul is trying to claim he's being shunned by the carnivore dogmatism. But in reality, he has been promoted by them every step of the way. It's almost as if he's trying to step into my shoes. I'm permanently banned from all carnivore forums, yet the moderators of these forums are actually posting content for Paul Saladino. Hmm, I wonder who has the shill connections. And then when you find out how little, when it comes to nutrition, how little nutrition education doctors receive. So many doctors that are giving you advice. Like I've had doctors say, you don't need to take vitamins, just eat a well-balanced diet. And I'm like, what are you talking about? First of all, you look like shit. Like, tell me what a well-balanced diet is. You have a gut. This is a crazy conversation. Joe, you're talking to a person that got his MD a few years ago whose complete knowledge of nutrition came from my YouTube channel. The irony is unbelievable. So if you look at the absolute nutritional content of grass versus grain, grass finished versus grain finished animals, they're pretty similar, okay? So muscle meats don't really matter. From a vitamin and mineral perspective, not much of a difference. What's different about grass-fed animals, in my opinion, is what they're not fed, what they're not subjected to. The most important thing is that you're avoiding high omega-6 and you're avoiding the agrochemicals. You, know, you can eat all the conventional meat you want and you'll eventually get the same nutrition as you would from this, except you're gonna be consuming so many chemicals, so much omega-6, you, know, you couldn't get to that nutritional status in a healthy way. 
42. Of course, Paul has the exact same viewpoints on grass-fed versus grain-fed beef that I've highlighted many times on my channel. Yeah. The grains are sprayed with glyphosate and atrazine, which is a known xenoestrogen. So it's a, it's a pesticide that turns male frogs into females. It's feminizing. Look at that, 600, now you're going into Alex Jones territories. <laughs> They're making the frogs gay. <laughs> atrazine is a xenoestrogenic herbicide and endocrine disruptor. Here is a visual of it causing ovaries to grow in a frog's testicles. 43. Hey, Paul, I'm glad I could do the research on atrazine for you. It's going to have less of that in its fat. Less, less of this, less glyphosate. Glyphosate's water soluble, so it'll probably be in the muscle. Atrazine is fat soluble. Toxins, pesticides, herbicides are stored in fat. But this is the kind of stuff that's never been really looked at. So grass feeding is not as much about the increased nutrient content Grass fed, grass finished, or grain finished, they're both nutrient rich, but the grass finished is gonna have less of the bad stuff in the meat and less mm. of the bad stuff in the fat, in my opinion. 44. In your opinion, you mean in Frank Tofano's opinion. You do a fantastic job of breaking this down though, and the fact that you do this all on memory. Yeah, Paul, you really do have an impressive memory, I must say. <laughs> I think mine's pretty good too, because I remember I said all this bullshit before you. The mainstream medical establishment doesn't agree with this, and I'm fully ready. And I think this is going to become my life's work. You know, it's just, it's, it's really exciting to be in this pace. Ah, well, you know, you better plan on changing your life's work because it's not yours. It's been mine. It will always be mine. And I'm not going anywhere. I don't know why I bothered doing this. It took me like 10 hours to go through all my past videos to find this crap. And I bet you there's, as I said, you know, 30, 40, 50 other instances that I just couldn't find because I'm not going to watch hundreds of hours of, of my old videos over again when I've already made, you know, four or five videos exposing this guy's plagiarism. He has adapted all of my ideas, even changes his ideas as I change mine, is starting to talk like me, has been talking like me, uses the same wording, basically stealing my entire persona. This guy's career should be canceled. It should be over, yet he's in the spotlight. What scares me is he hasn't even copied 10% of what's available on my channel. I bet you this guy's cookbook is going to be written solely from the recipes on my YouTube channel. And there's already a second edition of his book, probably because he read my book and said, oh, well, Frank talks positively about some carbohydrates and this ancestral diet stuff is a great idea. He's mimicking what I'm doing. Like, Am I gonna have to change my life so he stops copying me? Paul, just because you add complicated scientific terminology doesn't mean you can plagiarize my information. You did not add anything extra to my ideas. You just complicated and butchered them. The reason I was able to share these ideas on YouTube is because I interpreted that complicated scientific literature into simple layman's terms that the average person can understand which is also probably the only reason you were able to understand it well enough to copy it so then you could recomplicate it and put people to sleep on the podcast because they think you're a boring, non-charismatic prick. You know why Paul was breathing so heavy at the end of that podcast? He knows what he was doing. The amount of information he has stolen as well as the lies. What rubs salt in the wound is that he has no problem giving dozens of other cucks credit despite multiple times more information coming from me as a source. Oh yeah, Dave Feldman says it's healthy to have an LDL of 500. Lean math hyper responder. <laughs> These guys are fucking gonna kill someone because they're retarded. The craziest part about all of this is that there's probably twice as much plagiarism on that podcast that... I just couldn't find in my past videos. I can only spend so many hours doing this, guys. What's the point? As I said, I already exposed this guy so many times and it's just not sticking because he has so many connections. All his other buddies are keeping their mouth shut on YouTube to get their mediocre check. In a fair world, I would be invited to the Joe Rogan podcast. Joe would issue me a formal apology. Paul would be denounced as the quack he is because he's a plagiarizing scumbag, but that's not reality. These two degenerates are sitting in their sauna in Texas, counting money by selling people snake oil supplements. Uh, so 
Uh, that's probably going to be it. I really don't want to ever have to do that again. If I do any future updates on this guy's plagiarism, it will probably be maybe a, a quarterly or bi-yearly thing where I just point out where he got the information from. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not just me, guys. You know, he's plagiarized dozens of other people as well, except those people aren't, like, directly compromised because they're not in the carnivore diet space and they didn't have as much of their information stolen. You know, Jason Fung doesn't seem to care that his book cover title was taken. Ray Pete doesn't seem to care that Paul's spatting the same information about Omega-3. So, you know, they're all in the same club together. They're all making money together. Who cares if uh, one person is getting ripped off? So thank you guys for joining me. Uh, I'm probably going to take a break for a day or two just to collect my thoughts. You know, I have, I have no problem making videos every day. It's just, you know, what's the point if this guy is literally just going to copy every single thing as I do it? You know, if I start eating pasta tomorrow, Paul's going to be sponsored by the Italian Durham Wheat Board and start saying how good pasta is. Like, is this ever going to stop? Is it just going to continue? Is that the reality of what's going to happen?